you're creative, that's your whole life. It's your whole personality. It's hard when you get criticized at work for something you did. It's hard to get criticized of a joke, right? Because how do you not take it personally? Like you are creative. You just created this. Like, how do you not take it to heart? And so finding the balance of being satisfied with what I do, satisfied with the outcome of what I've created and understanding that not everyone's going to like it has been like a big game changer for my professional career and even in like my stand-up career. And I just encourage people who are creatives to like truly be okay with that. Like you think critiques in college are brutal? Wait till you have a CEO who doesn't believe in marketing and is tearing up your design to shreds. Like it's bound to happen. (laughs) It's going to happen. And you have to just be okay with that and know that it's not personal to you. Hey everybody, what is up? My name is Austin Heisler and you're listening to Your Creative Roadmap, episode number five. I am a van lifer and I used my creativity to build a business that allows me to travel the country and you can too. In this episode, I interview my friend Maddie, who is a content creator for the company Stickwood. And in this conversation, we talk about all the lessons that she's learned along her creative journey from going through college and getting her first few jobs. It's a great conversation. Let's jump into it. That's sick. I've not done anything in the Adobe like editing software for like videos probably in like three years. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. that sounds great. And that does... And I do have Adobe. So that is nice. All you have to do is like copy or copy, delete all that jazz because I think I would be so picky about editing. (laughs) Yeah. And I always, whenever I, whenever people ask me about like editing videos for social media or um, what they think of CapCut, I always, Mm. always, always point them to like Adobe. I'm like Premiere, like CapCut and all that stuff is nice because it's super user friendly, mm-hmm. but it's all trends. It's all based on trends. And mm-hmm. if you're running social media or doing anything for a business, and I know you as a designer, like when you do brand work and things like that for anybody or any kind of design, you don't want to be the same as everybody else. You want to stand mm-hmm. out. You want to stay true to your brand voice. So if all you're doing on social media is what everybody else is doing, everybody has the same kind of captions, then Mm -hmm. you're not really doing anything to set yourself apart. So I always steer people to using Adobe, not using those trendy, like user-friendly things because everybody else is. And Mm -hmm. just by being different and taking, learning that little bit of extra software to be able to have so much more customization to your content. It's really going to help you in the long run. That's awesome. I mean, I love Adobe die hard forever. (laughs) Oh yeah. Die hard Adobe, Mm -hmm. you know, screw Canva. (laughs) The thing is like, I still have to use Canva for work. Like really? And I'm totally, yeah. And like, I'm fine with that. Like the amount of content I have to make, is just so excessive and my Mm -hmm. designer she does like all the other stuff like i can ask her for anything and she'll do it but she's not like into social media as much and like we are quite literally rebuilding it like the engagement has just been so low Mm -hmm. and i've learned enough tricks to mimic like i don't even use templates like i just go in and just like pull stuff or like add yeah. my own PNGs, like we'll make our mm-hmm. own PNG like yeah. design files and then we'll paste them in there. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can resize and we'll call it good. Um, yeah. But I do, I miss Adobe. I don't use it as much as I would prefer mm-hmm. to, but also like I have so many other things happening in my job that <laughs> I got to like meet myself yeah. in the middle with what I can do. Yeah. I know I said screw Canva earlier, but I kind of use it. <laughs> Um, (laughs) for for what I um, when I do I kind of use a mixture between Adobe Photoshop Illustrator Mm -hmm. um, 
Canva. I use Canva mainly for, I would say, I like, I like it for, um, those little elements that you can get as so many pre-made elements, mm -hmm. which is nice. But a lot of times, like if you're, if you want to create your own, like I said, like everybody, those elements are open to everybody. So mm -hmm. if I was doing anything that I wanted to be like super like original, I could just, I know I have the skills, which is great that I could like make my own PNG elements in illustrator mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and then bring those in and then you can almost create your own little element library for your brand and just do all the composition in canva mm -hmm. but yeah. again that's why those skills are so so important mm -hmm. absolutely yeah i think i think like i don't for designers people are always like i think you should go to school and i was like well there's so many ways you could self teach yourself and if you're like dedicated enough to do it, that's awesome. But I think it is important to have like the core skills of like Adobe and like learning it and learning how to create your own PNGs. Like if I self-taught myself, I don't think I would have been as motivated, but that's also just because of my learning style. Like I have to be in a class, but I know a designer who's self-taught. I know a coder who's self-taught and like people who can do that, that's awesome. But you need to at least like, really focus on the fundamentals of like, you know, Canva is great. Everyone can use Canva. But like you said, how do you make yourself unique while using Canva is always like the tricky part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really like you said about being self-taught or like versus going to school. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of self-learning now, growing my own businesses and mm -hmm. just trying to always, always, <clears throat> educate myself and I feel like if I would have tried to educate myself from design from scratch the first thing that I learned when I was going to design school was we had to do you remember those multiplication sheets you used to do in like middle <laughs> school and you yeah. had to like do them super fast and you had to memorize My enemy. <laughs> yeah we had to do something like that for hotkeys in all the Adobe programs you had to memorize every single hotkey and write them all down. And would I have done that myself if I was self-learning? No. Mm -mm. <laughs> Do I, am I so thankful and glad that I know so many hotkeys when I'm in Premiere, when I'm in Illustrator, mm -hmm. After Effects, whatever I'm working on, whatever the project needs, like I am so happy that like they gave me that skill to learn that stuff and that's not something that I would have need and I feel like having structured learning is always so important so if anybody's mm -hmm. listening and they do want to um like self-teach like find there's so many mm -hmm. online courses now that weren't available mm -hmm. that like will give you that structure or master classes but you really got to take it down way down to the fundamentals and mm -hmm. even learning what x does in photoshop because that's going to mm -hmm. save you so much time and when you're in the design and marketing world time is everything 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 yeah. you have mm -hmm. to meet deadlines so um yeah. what i it, go ahead sorry go for it no go for it <laughs> i was gonna say what what inspired you to dive into the world of design in the first place Hmm. I've always known I wanted to be in a creative field, like I think in eighth grade or seventh grade. And I wanted to do interior design, actually. That was like really what I wanted to do. But my dad was like, you won't make any money and you can't play softball in school if you go to like a, like an art school or something. And at the time, softball was like my whole life. And so I did a lot of research and graphic design was like the first like creative job that came up that like you can make money for. <laughs> and so I was like, great, perfect. I'll do that. And then I started like reading more about it and realizing the world around me and how much graphic design actually is a part of our everyday life, whether we like realize it or not, like menus, billboards, 
um, posters, the stuff you get in the mail, like all of it. And that was just like so intriguing to me. I was like, every, like all of this designs around me and how have I like never noticed it before? And so I, one thing I do regret is in high school, I wish I would have taken more time for like my creative process because I think I don't, I didn't feel behind when I got to college, but since I played a sport my whole life, like I have never, I didn't truly experience the creative side of my personality until I was in college. Um, but I mean, I have, <laughs> I'm just like really dove in. I'm such a nerd. Now I have like type books, I have color books, I have the history of graphic design. I have, um, how to make grids, but I think the the true interest just came from loving art and creativity and then just like wanting to figure out a way to incorporate that into my life where I can make a living from it. Um, I think in a perfect world, I would have been like an art, like dealer collector or like, I don't know, I call it like an art pimp. Like I help artists sell their art. Like I think that would have been super great, but I really am thankful for the, the career that I picked. I'm thankful for the people I met in the creative world. I think that really helped motivate me because I think one thing people don't talk about when you get into the creative field is like how much you hit walls, especially in college. Like you hit creative walls so often and surrounding yourself with people that can help you like navigate that I think is super important. Community is so important when it comes to design. Yeah. Especially because when you're working on design, you can get in your own head and Mm -hmm. you can think like, this isn't good or this is good. And just art is so subjective. You don't, you won't know. Um, but design, the thing I like about design is has like a purpose. So the mm-hmm. artistic part is important, but in design, at least, you know, like if the art is like, I mean, it should be good, but if it's like not that great, <laughs> but the message is like clear right in their face, like whoever sees it gets the message. They do mm-hmm. the call to action. They hit the like button. They, call the number, they visit the website, whatever your purpose is for your design, you met your goal. And that's all that Mm -hmm. you need to do. And the art part will get better. So yeah, talk about some of those walls that you personally hit when you were transitioning from high school into college and going through art school. Yeah, I think one, one big wall. So before we had a graphic design professor Um, but he was not good. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. I got into freshman, sophomore year and people were like, rumor on the street is he's retiring. Like take all your other art classes and wait for the new guy to come in. And I was like, okay, cool. Can do that. So I took all these other art classes that I'm super thankful for, but I realized that I didn't feel as confident in them. And so I hit more walls frequently because I was like, okay, I don't even know what I want to experience. I don't even know what I want to portray and a way that for me, I like had to find different creative outlets in hopes that it will like get me out of that funk. So um, an example is like in drawing, I didn't know what I wanted to do for my final like drawing project. And so I like went out and used my photography equipment that I was using for my photography class and just like went out like downtown and just like shot a bunch of different things. I was like, this looks cool. This looks cool. And then I would like pull up the camera and be like, okay, is there anything in here that I feel inspired by to like do my like drawing final? Um, Another one was in my graphic design class. The first class I took was with the new professor, uh, Chris Fox. He was, he's a very hard professor. He pushed me so, so hard, especially in my creative blocks. Cause he was like, I know you have it in you. Like, I need you to find it. And I was like, I don't know where to find it. though. (laughs) And so one thing that we had done is we called them 30 clocks. And so you get 30 minutes to design as many five by five squares as you can in Adobe and illustrator. And you just like throw stuff on there, like no theme, no nothing. You just start throwing stuff onto it and hoping that it looks good. Or there'll be times where he does give you like, okay, you have to use these colors and like this font, but 
that is something I still do to this day when I get into a creative funk, because if I'm like, I have an idea and I have five different versions of what it could look like and I don't know where to go. I just do literally 30 minutes and try to get all of those things like on a screen and be like, okay, what actually is appealing to me? And like, what would appeal to a consumer or a viewer and anything in that realm? Um, I think my biggest blocks for me come when I'm starting to feel like too comfortable or I don't challenge myself enough. So I always have to find ways to push myself. Otherwise I'm just going to get lazy and complacent with my design work. And that's not satisfactory for me. So I always have to remind myself, like I have to find things that are really stimulating and I can push the creativity in a direction that maybe I wouldn't necessarily have done before. I hope that answered your question. I don't know. (laughs) That totally did. And I'll have to try that five by five square thing. I feel Mm -hmm. like what that reminded me of is, um, trusting your gut and design, which is something that you Mm -hmm. just have to learn through your reps and things like that. Do you feel like doing something? What were, what was the results of that um, exercise? Usually what was the results Mm -hmm. at the end? (laughs) Some were bad. Like I would just like look at those and be like, I can't believe I just spent 30 minutes doing, (laughs) doing these, but I'm at a point where kind of like you said, like I trust myself. Like I am very aesthetically in tune. Like I love matching colors. I love decorating. Um, So on the good days when I do good ones, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm slightly impressed (laughs) with myself because it is just a lot of like, okay, I like these colors. I like this font. I like this wave. How do we just make it look nice? And I try not to put too much thought into each one. I truly just try to spend five, seven minutes if I'm trying to make more than three and just like, cool, that looks great. Move on. We'll try again. And then at the end is like when I'll sit and like reflect on it. And when I do them and I sit and I reflect and I like refine them, I'm always like, oh, right. Like I am not bad at what I do. I just have to not, I'm hard on myself. I'm always hard on myself, especially with my work. And so anytime I do create something that took me very little brain work, I'm like, ah, yes, like (laughs) I can still do this, whether it's something that is hard for me or on days that it's not. And I think that is a really great reminder, especially if you feel like if you're having like imposter syndrome and you're just like, I'm overthinking everything, like literally just pull up a five by five in Adobe Illustrator and just put on music and just go for it. I think people are more impressed with their work when they aren't like, I don't want to say fully present because being present is really important, but when you aren't overanalyzing it, like truly doing what you feel and like what you know, I think is, has been great for me at least. Yeah, that is totally doing what you feel and Mm -hmm. doing like what you know is so important. And I feel like that's when the artistic side comes out that is in design, you know, Mm -hmm. you can design, but once you start putting what you like want and feel into it, that's when you'll start growing your artistic chops and know how to make those smarter decisions. So after you, um, you're in, art school you just got out of high school and Mm -hmm. you um are trying to beat these walls and you're doing all these exercises Mm -hmm. after college like what did your process look like for finding design work because i know that is Mm -hmm. another big hump that designers have to get over like everybody tells me that you can make money with design and i just paid all this money to go to school and no, I don't know where to go. Mm-hmm. No, finding a design job after school is so hard unless you like know people or you really focus on your portfolio all of your senior year and do like internships and things like that. Um, I did. So I graduated like when COVID. So like 
spring of 2020 was when I graduated. So finding a job in general was not an easy thing because people were losing jobs, things were moving to remote, some were like still in person. And so I didn't have a job until October of 2020. And I worked at Starbucks during that time, but I did some freelance, which was great. But right out of college and like too ethical, like I didn't want to charge people more than what I felt was worth it. But then everyone was like, you're undercharging. And I was like, okay, I can't do freelance. <laughs> like it was just too much. Like I didn't feel confident enough in my ability. But I also graduated with someone who still does freelance. And like that is the majority of their income. It just wasn't something that was sustainable for me. Um, and so I did like business cards for my friends you know, who were like doing networking. I did a lot of resumes actually for people at like Starbucks. I would take their information and then just make their resume look pretty. I still do that actually quite a lot for people. Um, But really like it felt like I was playing the long game. Like I was updating my website. I was updating any, anytime I did anything new, I would like add it to it. But I think one thing that held me back just a little bit was that like I didn't do enough design for myself like I was only creating work for other people and although yes it was my work it didn't feel like me and I think I would have like if I was to go back I would spend at least an hour a day every other day creating something that I enjoyed and showcasing that because I feel like when I got to interviews they were like yeah your work is cool but like what like what makes it you like why did you make this And I was just like, because I had like, I got paid to, you know, and so really applying to jobs as a full time job. And the way that my school kind of set up the design program at the time, it's not like this now. Um, You took business classes with the graphic design uh, major. And so we took communications, I took advertising, um, just like business 101. And so when I was looking for jobs, I was like, okay, I can't, if I can't just do design, I got to like lean into marketing. I have marketing. I know how to do it. And so I ended up doing a lot of like marketing specialist roles that were heavy in design. Um, And there were, there are actually quite a few. When you look at marketing specialists, like roles, design is a good part of it. Um, And that was, I was like, that's like, and I also just wanted a job. (laughs) Like I was at that point where I was like, I don't care what field we're in. I just need a job. Um, and my first job was actually in a, for a physical therapy company and I was a marketing specialist and it was a great first job. I had a really great first boss, but I realized very quickly that selling a service was something that was not going to be for me. (laughs) Like I can't sit here and tell you, you need physical therapy. Like I'm not a salesperson. Um, but that first job, although wasn't necessarily what I wanted, it ended up really benefiting me. And so I think when you are applying to jobs, you have to be open minded. Like I only wanted graphic design jobs that was not working out for me. So I had to pivot into marketing, although that wasn't what I wanted. It was the right path because now I, I still work in marketing and I love it. I love what I do. And so embracing the waves that come with it acknowledging that it is a full-time job, finding a job. And I lost my train of thought. I don't know if I have a third one, (laughs) but yeah, finding a job as a creative is much harder than I think most people give credit for, in my opinion. Yeah. How important was your personal brand when you were applying for those jobs? Mm. (laughs) That's such a good question. I don't, I had a brand, but it wasn't like looking back, it was not me. Like who I was then and who I am now is complete 180. But I was very particular. Like a lot of my social accounts were on private. I was like, okay, only want all of my professional stuff to be front forward. Um, my whole thing when interviewing was like, be like funny. Cause that's like the one thing big thing I have going for me was like, be funny, be like personable and fake it till you make it. Like sometimes you just gotta be like, Oh yeah, I've totally 
because at the time I've done Adobe, but I have never done Premiere editing. And they were like, have you done Premiere editing? I was like, absolutely, I have. Yes. And the thing is, like, I've, I only did it once at that job. And so it's obviously not lying, but making sure that, like, you are. And the thing is, one thing I will say, if you do fake it till you make it, if you do get the job, learn what you just faked. Like, I did study up on what Premiere was like, because I wasn't just going to say that I did it and then showed up not knowing how to do it. Um, but it was, I was very particular of like how I presented myself. And I think now I would say my personal brand is much different than what it was then. I'm definitely more confident. Um, but it was important because obviously you want to put a good foot forward and at a first job, like you don't want to mess up. And so it's just like really trying to maintain that image that you sold but then also like embracing that you're changing throughout the whole process too, if that makes sense. That does make sense. So knowing what you do now, you said your, your personal brand and your image in your mm-hmm. professional career flipped 180. What, mm-hmm. what would you do different with your like branding and your like resume and your portfolio that you know now, mm. like back then to like almost help you get that first job even faster or help you get more Mm -hmm. of what you wanted yeah i would say we did do a resume class in college or we had like a section of it where we would literally build our resume and then we hung them up and like we walked through each one and like marked it up like we were brutal like it is not a very and so i knew what my voice was one thing i have on my resume i've had since day one is instead of like contact me i always say let's be friends And I always do a little like intro about myself. And I always say, hi there, I'm Maddie. Like I try to make it as personable as I can because I'm not a serious businesswoman. Like I never have been and I never will. Um, I'll be serious when I need to. But my whole approach is just trying to be as like real as I can while coming off like I know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Um, I think the one thing I would tell my younger self is pick my first resume was bright blue it was did not need to be sky blue uh i used too many fonts (laughs) um it just was like it had information and i also like the way my resume is now is like i did this because of this whereas like when i was applying to jobs i was like i did freelance these are the people i did freelance for i did you know business cards rack cards website whatever but I didn't explain why I was doing them or like, and I think one thing about resumes is like now at my last job, I would say, I'm trying to think. Okay. We'll say that my current job was I create content to like sell our product or like explaining why you're doing what you're doing because people can see like, Oh yeah, cool. She designs, but what is she designing for? Um, showing that like what you do has value to it. Um, I didn't do that probably up until this, the resume I have now only because I have a friend that works in HR and her and I literally sat on zoom for like an hour and a half. And she was like teaching me the right way to structure a like professional tailored resume. Um, but I think everyone should watch a resume video or do a resume building in college or even right after because your first round of a resume, you're not going to like it. Second round, you're probably not going to like it. Like it's going to take you five rounds to figure out what makes it look like, like you're ready to be hired essentially. Um, But my advice is always like one pop of color, one neutral color, neutral color should always be in my opinion, the main piece of paper and then the pop of color it comes in like the headers or like your name and you only do two fonts i hate when i see more than three fonts on a resume it drives me crazy that's also just me being really picky like i'll be driving and if i see like a word that's not lined up on like a billboard or something i'm like how are they how are they not lined up right now um but i think keeping it simple but expressing who you are as a designer um because unfortunately as designers like we don't like we're not accountants you know like you don't just go to the office type numbers come home and you're done like as a designer you wake up 
you breathe art and design and you come home and then you're probably still doing some art and design for yourself. And so like, I'm trying to think. And so making sure that like you understand that you are presenting a professional version of yourself while trying to be as authentic as you can to your work outside of like work itself but try to be as authentic as you can professionally. Um, it's, it's a tricky balance, but it's something that unfortunately like has to be done. And I think resumes is always a very great first step in figuring out how to do that. It really is. And I feel like resume is a great first design project. Like mm-hmm. if you're just starting in design. Everything that you touched on, it'll teach you typography, it'll teach Mm -hmm. you color theory, and it'll teach you composition and Mm -hmm. kerning of all your fonts. All three Mm -hmm. of those things, like the core fundamentals of design, you can bust out in one project and really get a lot Mm -hmm. of learning. But I hear you. Absolutely. The font thing drives me nuts too. I feel. If I see something with like so many fonts, I'm just like, why? Especially why? Like on menus. Like if I see a crazy menu, I am just like, there's no way someone sat and did this like consciously. <laughs> I was like, there's five fonts, there's five different colors, there's a million images. It like, it, anytime I, I w- there was this one menu, and I compare it to the Schitt's Creek like menu. Have you seen Schitt's Creek? Yes. Okay, so in the um, in the cafe, and it's just like a never-ending uh, menu. I had one of those once, and I it like every page, different color, different fonts, and it like could have been cool if it was done right. But I'm sitting there looking at this, and I was like, "This is insane." <laughs> there were probably like ten fonts in total, and I just could not, I couldn't handle it, honestly. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Do you, can you name off the top of your head, like maybe one restaurant that you know that had like a really good design in their menu? Um, one place it's called the commons. It's here. It's, um, a very, it's delicious. The theme is very like seventies, but very mellow. Like it's kind of like steeped. I don't want to say it's underground, but you have to take a few steps down to like get in there. They are very, everything's very clean and very retro in a way that doesn't feel like unmodern. Um, But their menu is very concise. Drinks on one side, food on the other. They use different pops of color for like vegan, vegetarian. Um, But it's, it it reads easy. And I think one thing that people don't think about when you are designing, especially in a type heavy setting is the way that eye travels so when you are like reading a menu or a resume you want to make sure that you are reading it as if a consumer is reading it um because i've seen resumes where it goes like top left top right here and then back over when in reality you just need to let the eye naturally flow with the like the boldness like of a header or like a line or something. And this menu does that. Like it's not, obviously there's no lines or arrows, but the way that they have done their type hierarchy makes the eye like not strain at all. Cause I think, I've, I mean, you could Google like bad, <laughs> bad graphic design and your eyes will just boom all over the place. And then people just aren't gonna wanna read what you have. Um, Because they're going to be like, hey, this hurts my eyes. I can't understand anything that's happening. Um, And so that's what I look for when I'm at menu, (laughs) when I'm at a restaurant. It's like, how easy is this to read? How do I enjoy reading it? Is it easy to read? Because sometimes places will also do like four sentences of what the meal is. And I'm just like, I just need to know the ingredients. But I mean, that also just makes something longer. I'm all about how do we make it as concise as possible in a cute way that people enjoy. Like, I don't need extra information that comes with it. Um, but they are the first place I think of that have a great resume, not resume, a great menu. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Readability is mm-hmm. 
huge. So going back to your first job, Mm -hmm. what were some important lessons that you learned when you worked at that first job? Oh gosh, so many. My first boss's name was Leanna. Absolute girl boss to a T. She had she had three kids, you know, a full life. And she was just like one of the most inspiring first bosses I think I could ever have. And she was someone who could lay down the law and then be like, oh my gosh, like you did so good. Like she was able to balance the hardness with the softness. And one thing that I learned really early on, I'm a big exclamation mark person, <laughs> like through and through. And especially with women in, in any field, adding like an exclamation mark or using more words is like, I don't want to say it's unprofessional, but it's almost like, okay, well, we have to be extra friendly because we're in this industry and like, we don't want people to be upset. And so one thing that she had taught me and I came, we did weekly one-on-ones and she's like, you're doing so great. She's like, I want you to be more assertive in your emails. And I was like, what do you mean? And she goes, I love that you all love exclamation points. She goes, but you don't have to do that here. She's like, you are now like a working professional. And if you don't want to do something for someone and you're able to explain it to them, that's fine. And she goes, you don't have to like be overly friendly. You don't need to try to be friends with everyone. She's like, you can be like just working colleagues with, with people. Right. And so she taught me how to be more assertive in my email writing. I'm still a very friendly emailer. I don't like to use the sharpness um, in emails unless I really have to. But she taught me how to like write emails that I didn't have to over explain myself and be like, I'm doing this because of X, Y, and Z. She was like, you're doing this for one reason. They don't need to know the other ones. Like you are in this job because I trust you to do this job. You don't have to explain yourself to everyone that comes up to you and tells you to do something. So that was the first thing I learned was to be more assertive. And I've always had a hard time with that. So having a like person I admired be like, you need to do this. I was like, okay, I can do this. Um, I learned how to like advocate for myself. Like I wanted a title change. So I ended up being a marketing specialist to a creative marketing specialist because I wanted, I don't want to stay like just in basic marketing. I wanted to keep doing design and my end goal in my career as a creative director. And so like, I was like, if I want to get there, I need to start having titles and work that can back up that goal that I have for myself. And so she taught me, you know, to advocate for myself. Like I, there was a day where I just like, wasn't feeling well. And I came into the office and I didn't need to come into the office. And she was like, she literally, she walked in and she goes, you look like shit. And I was like, I feel like shit. You're right. And she was like, just go home. And I was like, well, I have to be here. And she's like, no, she's like, you should have just told me, you know, yesterday or this morning that you weren't going to come in. And she goes, I need you just to like, be okay with saying no. And she goes, and that's okay to say no. And that was like another really big thing because I don't like saying no. But those like three things of like being assertive, advocating for myself and saying no were like just the three biggest things that I think I needed as like a little green bean entering into a, into a work field that is not going to be super friendly all the time. Like work, you're going to have bad days and you're going to have to be the bad guy. And She taught me how to navigate that in a way that was comfortable enough for me because I'm not someone who's going to call you out in a meeting. Like I'll voice concerns, but like she would be like, "Mm, no, I don't like that. And here's why I don't like that. And here's how you're going to do it different. And, or like if there was some kind of conflict, she would just bring it up like in a meeting. And I was like, that's great for you, not for me. And so she did a really great job of, figuring meeting me in the middle on the things that I needed to improve on. And I think that I think just like that sentence alone, like makes her like the great first boss that I could have had. I love all of those. And when you learn to be that assertive person and when you like, it just grows your confidence and it Mm -hmm. also teaches you how to make, 
design decisions, even though they weren't mm-hmm. necessarily design things that you learned, it's all stuff that you can like just transfer over even when you're writing copy for design. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe this doesn't need to be friendly. Maybe it's more of a serious thing. So Mm -hmm. I don't put as many explanation points as Mm -hmm. you said. So tell me about where you are now and how you got from that job to what you're doing right now. Um, So I was at my first job for just under a year and a half. Um, And I ended up taking a job with Art Prize here in Grand Rapids. And my coworker, who then became my manager at my first job, was also a friend, like a great friend. And I thank her so much, honestly, for where I'm like where I'm at in my career, because she pushed me and was like, as your manager, yes, I would be very sad to see you leave. But as your friend, she goes, this is a job you have to take because it was it was like literally the the best thing that could have happened. Like I was entering into social media at my first job but I really wanted to just see if I could just do it full time or if it, like if I wanted other things in my job. So I went to art prize and I did all of their social media management and communications. Um, I helped the graphic designer when she needed it. I helped the marketing director when she needed it. But my whole job was truly creating content and like advertising the, the greatness that art prize is. Um, I was there for six months, loved it throughout my whole time there. I posted like over a thousand times, 800 was within those like three and a half weeks of art prize, which sounds ridiculous, but it really happened. And when I tell people that they're like, how'd you do that? And I was like, I mean, that's across five platforms. Like it's not just one. I said, but also when you're running around for three weeks, you know, you got, (laughs) there's no excuse. And why not to post, you know, 800 times. Um, But that was a great learning experience. They're a nonprofit. I love nonprofit work. I think if I could have stayed with them, if that was an option, I 100% would have. I love art. I'm very involved in the art community here. Um, I'm friends with gallery owners. I go to a lot of like shows and pop-ups. And so that was a great um season because it just reminded me of my love for design and art because I did get to a point where I was like I'm not even making anything I enjoy and so being a part of an organization that is truly art and creative based and they were like do what you think is best and if we have edits we'll come to you later was like incredible and so that job helped me find my creativity and design love again and so when that contract was up um once again, in the place of finding a job was hard. It was literally a full-time job finding one. And so I got really lucky and I found, I got hired for um, a company that is a realtor company. It was a fully remote job in Grand Rapids and ended up being sadly one of the worst jobs I've ever had. But it was a great learning experience because I thought I would like working for a big team that kind of functioned as an agency. I thought I would like working fully remote. Um, I thought I would like um, interacting with as many people as I did. And all of those things I did not like doing. (laughs) And so it was it was interesting learning that about myself and being like, okay, I thought I would like to be a part of a big team, but no, I mean, there were 20, 20 people on our team. And I just was like, I don't want to have to talk to 20 people every day. Like that sounds like a lot. Um, and they gave me like monitors. So I could only work from my house. I couldn't like work anywhere else. So I was very creatively blocked as well. The work itself was nothing that was new to me. Like I had done that at my at my other two jobs. Um, and so it just wasn't stimulating. I wasn't growing. I was at this point where I was like, I want to grow. I want to challenge myself. And this job is not doing it for me. Um, and that was a really sad realization because I had so much hope going in. Um, but then of course, realizing like selling a service is once again, not for me. And so I think that was my like, okay, I can only, my next option is e-commerce. And that's what I'm in now. 
Um, so I work for a company called Stickwood. We create a product. It's literally what it sounds like, wood that sticks to things. Um, we It's for um, interior designers and just like DIY crafters. It's real wood planks with adhesive on the back and you stick it right onto the wall. So like accent walls, ceilings, um, stairs, wineries, like name it. It can go anywhere. Um, we've been on like HGTV, Queer Eye, Netflix, um, Better Homes and Gardens. Like it's, it's such a fascinating product and e-commerce is a whole different beast that I knew was going to be a beast. But now that I'm in it and I've been at this job for three and a half months, I am like going to be consistently learning about e-commerce probably for the next year because it's not a service. It's not a nonprofit. You are quite literally trying to sell something to people. And that is something that has been a bit of a growing pain for me is learning to sell something in a way that's not aggressive, that is resonatable for interior designers, decorators, DIYers, people who work on HGTV, like all of that stuff. Um, and then on top of, you know, I'm not just doing social media. My, I mean, my title is content creator and community manager, but I'm also like managing the influence influencers that we work with. I manage anything that is like publication wise. Um, I help with a lot of marketing. The other two people on my team are designers by trade, which is awesome because I get to talk about, you know, design with these people who really know what they're talking about, but marketing isn't necessarily their strongest suit. And so it's, but they know more about e-commerce. So it's like, I'm teaching them marketing. They're teaching the e-commerce and it's really become this like, organic flow between the three of us which is awesome but it's also daunting because i'm 25 and then like a role that's like an actual adult like role like i don't really have a manager i just kind of like show up you know when i can um i have a lot of creative freedom but it's i mean i really do love what i do i realize selling a product is fantastic um, it's not a big company. There's probably 50 of us total, including our manufacturer, which is connected to our office. Um, we, I mean, the things that we do, we're, we can print art on our wood, which is super awesome. So we're like partnering up with like artists and businesses for us to like get, you know, either a true artist design or a photo and we can like paint it and print it right onto the wood. And that is something that we're really, really excited about. It's something I'm really excited about because you are mixing a natural, a natural canvas with um, just like pure art. Like you're mixing nature and art in a way that doesn't feel unorganic. And I think that's so cool. And we're actually going to be a part of our prize next year. And we're going to re- do like a grant and find an artist who wants to design something for our product specifically and then we'll do a permanent install somewhere downtown um, during art prize and just like that alone is so exciting and i mean everyone on the team is so excited because they're all design lovers and we love nature and we love you know we just everyone that i work with actually loves what they do (laughs) and so that is also like a crazy thing because at my last job no one liked what they did. And I was the only one that was like, I can't work at a job that I hate. And so I took the jump into here, fingers crossed that it would be something I enjoy. And it was, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy job at all, but I love it. It's challenging. I do what I love to do. I get to work with really great people. And like looking back at like my whole career thus far, which is like, like four years, I think at this point, like starting off as a little green bean at like a physical therapy job (laughs) that I just was like, I don't know what I'm doing to where I am now. where like, I'm making more, again, making manager decisions. I'm talking to my CEO daily. I'm going on work trips. Like I'm running things on my own. It's just like a crazy to think that like, I've been doing this for four years and I just worked my butt off to get where I am now 
but I'm so thankful that I had a great boss at my first job. I got to learn and remind myself of creativity in my second job. In my third job, I realized I didn't like the things I thought I was going to like. And now I'm at a job that I know I will be at for the next three to five years. And I think if you can learn something from each job that you've had, then I think, and then it's not a mistake that you were there. And I'm sure that there will be, I mean, I'm sure there's people who have jobs that they don't put on their resume because it was that bad, but that doesn't, but you still learned, (laughs) you know, that you don't like that type of management. You don't like that type of leadership. You don't like the way that teams are like move and just like things like that. And so it was, I'm just very grateful for my career experience because I think I would have been more miserable if I didn't find the growth or the positives in each job. That's so awesome. It sounds like you (laughs) are right where you're supposed to be. Where do you see Mm -hmm. yourself moving after this? Like, what are your next goals and aspirations for your career? If you know, Uh, like I said, like my end goal is a creative director. That is like truly where I want to be. Like I love designing now, but I am such a big picture optimist that I know I will get to a point where I just want to have ideas and then work with someone who can bring those to light. I'm not there yet, but I know that's where I will end up. I'm like, I want to say, unfortunately, I know that that's just where I will go. Um, I don't know how long I'll be here. I think my goal is for us to grow the marketing team and then maybe in hopes that I could be a creative like director here. But if that doesn't happen, like I have already made really great connections with people and we're only gaining more connections. And I know I will talk with people at HGTV. I know I will like work with like we were on Little John's HGTV show, like one of the episodes our product was in. And I know that I will grow a lot just here in general. I would love to stay in the more design or creative field, whether that is e-commerce or a nonprofit or an art museum. I am very open to where the creative directory could go um, in what field. I just have no idea. And it's one of those things where it's like, I'm very content with where I am that I'm just going to ride this out until I get to a point where I'm like, okay, I need to advocate for myself more. Um, But hopefully I will like have a goal. I would love to live somewhere else too. Like I've been in Grand Rapids for almost eight years now, which is crazy to think about. And I love it here, but I would love to live somewhere else for like a short amount of time or just like be able to work remote and just like travel for a little bit. Um, cause I'm at that point where it's like, okay, I love, I mean, I love Grand Rapids. I love this community. I love the people here, but when you're in somewhere for too long, you get, you just want to go somewhere. And so I'm hoping that maybe within my time with this company, I will make connections with people who are able to give me the opportunity to fulfill what I want to do. Um, at least that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> I love Grand Rapids. I just spent my last, um, the last two months of the summer in Muskegon. We were. Oh no, you froze. At, oh, there you are. <laughs> um, I was saying, I love Grand Rapids. My wife and I, we just spent our last two months in Muskegon. Uh-huh. And, yeah, we were, do you know, have you ever been to Pier Marquette Beach? Mm-hmm. Yep. So we literally park our van at Pier Marquette Beach all day so we just hang out there go on walks go to the deck um love the deck love the deck i love the deck so much (laughs) it's so so fun it is so fun and the music there is they have music going like every single night Mm -hmm. have you ever been to their other restaurant forks and pints no i have not really really good so I think it's only like 12 minutes away. So the deck will, oh, is okay. closed mm-hmm. now because of the season, but they reopen a little tavern called Forks Ooh. and Pines. And it's like really, really good, like winter comfort food. Oh, that's so smart. That is how you do it. Yep. If you're going to have like, I mean, the deck is popping. Like you wait in the summertime to like get a seat there. 
And that's yes. so smart to do live music. It's large. The drinks and food are incredible. But when the season ends, I mean, some people, that's like it. Like you don't do anything yeah. else until next season. But that's so smart to be like, okay, now everyone had fun and was happy in the summer. Now we're going to get to fall and winter and people are going to be sad. <laughs> we got to give them yeah. comfort food. Yep. Like, genius. Genius. Super genius. And also talking about marketing, the deck does a great job doing all their marketing. I feel like mm -hmm. whoever's doing their stuff is they do a killer job. Yeah. What do I you do like, do like their stuff. What do you usually get when you go there? Do you get their tacos? I do. I get their tacos and then I love their slushy drinks. Um, mm -hmm. they're frozen. I don't drink that much anymore, but I am a sucker for sangria and a frozen slushy. And they have, yeah. I think it's a blueberry one. I honestly don't mm. know. I only went there twice this summer. Yeah. And, but I mean, I love those slushy drinks, especially when it's hot. Cause there's not yeah. there's some shading, but I don't ever want to sit in like a corner. So I always like want to be near the sun. It's my mm -hmm. like slushy and I are melting away. Um, yeah, <laughs> hoping that we'll we'll make it through. But yeah, tacos and their slushies are to die for. Yeah, Grand Rapids has great food and a great farmers market. Oh great my Great farmers gosh. market. Mm -hmm. We have so the thing that's like so interesting about Grand Rapids is it's so up and coming still. Like I think that's one thing that's so like we're building an amphitheater on the Grand River and we're going to be, I guess, doing a semi pro soccer field here in the next 10 years. And so in, I mean, in the art community here has grown so much, like the amount of musicians that are here, open mics are constant gallery shows are every day of some kind, like Grand Rapids has truly turned into like this creative hub and like not many people know about it. And so my hope is that people will start coming to Grand Rapids and start creating work just because it's, we're in the Midwest. You don't have many creative pockets. And so I'm very, I, I mean, I love Grand Rapids. I will sing its praises all day. Absolutely. So to finish this podcast off, tell us about your comedy career and how that's going. <laughs> um, it's, it's I've actually taken two months off, which is surprising, mm -hmm. but my life got crazy and sad and messy. And I just was like, I will be able to laugh about this in two months. <laughs> and I'm at the point where I'm ready to laugh about it. Um, but I've been doing stand up since I think January, January of 2022 was my first show. And it actually had been something I wanted to do for a really long time. I've had people be like, you should do stand up. And I'm like, me? No. Um, but it was like, I'm so glad I did. It was actually a New Year's resolution for me going into 2022 was I want to do stand up and I want to feel confident enough to open myself up to dating. Those were the two things uh, I had. I don't do anything more than two because I, I want to accomplish those things that I do. So stand up was my biggest one. And the first show was at a bar called Turnstiles. And it's one of my favorite bars here. They have this incredible, it's called a raspberry beret. And it is the tartest raspberry drink you'll ever drink. But I went there and they only did music live nights. Like they didn't, they've never had comedy. And so I show up, sign my name and the girl comes up to me and was like, Hey, you're next. Just keep it at three songs. And I was like, well, I, uh, I don't sing. I tell jokes. And she was like, oh, my gosh, really? That's so exciting. You've never had anyone do comedy here. And I was like, I've never done comedy either. So you shouldn't hype me up so much. <laughs> like, let's keep it chill. <laughs> but I went up there terrified, felt like I was going to throw up and then like came down. And there were people who were like high fiving me. And they were like, that looks like you've been doing that for years. And I was like, no. Nope. I just faked it to you guys. Um, but once I did it once, it kind of became intoxicating. Like I am such an introvert, so I don't put myself out there too much, but doing comedy, it's, I am such, I don't take things too seriously. I joke around all the time. I love it. It's who I am. I embrace it. And so going up there and people having to listen to me tell jokes for like seven minutes is like perfect because 
it like feeds, it feeds my extrovertedness enough to where I'm like, okay, I can do this next week. Um, and so I started slowly started embedding myself with, um, different people who have different, um, like shows every night, there's a different place you can do comedy and learning how to find those people was really nerve wracking. Stand up comedy has taught me how to one, like make yourself known because I am someone who just kind of will hide in the background, like make yourself known and ask for what you want. And because most of the people in comedy are men are like white men. And so I'm in a crew of like, there's probably 10 women in Grand Rapids, 10, 15 women who do stand up. And if you aren't vocal about what you want, like where you want to go, like you're not going to be just gifted like your time or anything. And so that really taught me of like, Hey, I want to do your show next week. Do you have time? If not, when's the next time you have available and just making yourself known. Um, I have found like it's healing in a way too. I think cause I probably would have been a theater kid in another life, like <laughs> looking back, but doing stand up is something that I've been really able to lean on as a creativity outlet. Um, kind of like I was saying how you hit walls, like the few ways I get out of that is now like comedy. I love doing physical collage. Like I'll just get things, cut them up and paste them together. Um, but comedy, like I use humor as something I use in my, like in my marketing work. Like, I don't want you to feel like you're just reading this super boring blog about like why or how we make our product. Like, I want you to like see a post or a video and be like, oh my gosh, that was so funny. And then save it and then come back to it. Like humor is like, in my opinion, such a key part in marketing because people remember humor. They aren't going to remember that you just had someone speak at you for 10 seconds, whatever it is. And so comedy has been a really great way for me to express that side of my like career. Obviously the comedy is going to be different <laughs> than me going up and doing stand up on a Tuesday night. Um, but it's, it's been awesome. I think if anyone wants to try it, do it like truly the, you know, if you do it once, twice, you're going to be like, oh, okay, it's not that bad. Especially if there's tons of other people going up. Um, like some people will remember you if you have like a baller joke, but ultimately like people are just there to laugh. Sometimes they'll come up to you. Most of the time they don't. And it's just nice to be like, oh yeah, that one girl told one funny joke but they don't know my name. They don't know where I live. They don't know how often I do this. Like you're kind of also anonymous in a way. Um, but yeah, I took the last two months off, which honestly was kind of, was probably really good for me. I was writing jokes nonstop and none of them were anything I was like proud of. And so now I'm at the point where I've gotten through this period of my life where I'm now like, okay, I can laugh about this stuff. I can write about this stuff. You know, kind of when you enter into a new era of your life or comedy and you have those new set of jokes, that is like a big trial and error, right? Because I can go and I can say those first round of new jokes. Some of it will do well, some of it won't. But now you just have like a month and a half of retailering that joke for it to be good. Same with design, right? Like you go back and re, you know, update and update and update. And I think stand-up comedy is design and creative in a way. And I try to find the similarities between like what I do and comedy. One, to just keep myself on track <laughs> to be like, okay, you are a creative person. You have different creative outlets that you can work through. How can they complement each other? Because like I said, you're a design. When you're creative, that's your whole life. It's your whole personality. It's hard when you get criticized at work for something you did. It's hard to get criticized of a joke, right? Because how do you not take it personally? Like you are creative. You just created this. Like, how do you not take it to heart? And so finding the balance of being satisfied with what I do, satisfied with the outcome of what I've created and understanding that not everyone's going to like it has been like a big game changer for my professional career. And even in like my standup career. Um, and I just encourage people who are creatives to 
like truly be okay with that. Like you think critiques in college are brutal. Wait till you have a CEO who doesn't believe in marketing and is tearing up your design to shreds. Like it's bound to happen. (laughs) It's going to happen. And you have to just be okay with that and know that it's not personal to you. Like I know when I go up on stage, not everyone's going to laugh at my jokes. That's fine. I know my target demographic, but I go home and I get sleep at night because I know at the end of the day, it's not going to matter, but making sure that you have the thick skin and acknowledging that it's not you that they're attacking. It's just, they don't understand what you're creating. And so it's your job to explain what you're creating in a way that is like something you're comfortable with and something that makes other people understand. Um, But I love it. I love telling jokes. It's honestly one of my favorite things. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's been a bummer not being able to do it, but I'm excited to get back out there. Yeah. To end the podcast, give us one joke. Give us one joke. Oh my gosh. Um, let me think. I, (laughs) I tell this, hang on, let me pull up my phone. I just have like tons of bits on my phone. I have about a hundred (laughs) notes. just like random things that I think of. Mm -hmm. Um, One, (laughs) I just compared like finishing a chapstick to like finishing eye drops. Cause like I have such dry eyes that like I finish a chapstick and I'm like, I have accomplished a season of life. I get to buy a new flavor. And I feel that way about eye drops. I'm like, I've lived such a busy life that I just ran out of all these eye drops. But that's not like, that's not even funny. So let me, I do this one where I talk about how I got cat called last summer, like, like as I was leaving a like bodega and this guy shouts across the way, like, if you were my girl, I'd carry you to your car. And I stopped. I was like, you know what? I could get, I could carry, I could get carried to my car right now. I got the vodka in my hand. I could use a little carry. Um, but I keep moving, you know, because I'm a big crime junkie, not trying to get murdered in a bodega parking lot. Um, and I always say the funniest part of the story is I told my boyfriend this story and I still walk to my car. Like I have a man on his, like, I'm assuming his hands and knees for me in the parking lot being like, I'll carry you. I love you. And I still have to walk to my car. And I just find like that's unfair. And I think that if I have a man in the parking lot wanting to carry me, that my boyfriend should also want to carry me. <laughs> and so I, I use that. Um, I say that he laughs at it. He thinks it's hilarious. He's like, well, I could carry you. He's like, but you don't let me. And I was like, you're right. I don't, but it's a bit, it's funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you got to lean into it. And most of the time that comes with like my dating bits of history I don't talk about dating that much. I just do a lot of like observation comedy. Um, but I also, I mean, you know, my family, I got a wild family. So there's always yeah. stuff in there. About yep. them too. Um, and they love it. They're like, Oh my gosh, our story's being told. And I was like, well, kind of, <laughs> that's from my point yeah. of view. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Maddie, for your time. I feel like you gave so much great advice, so much great wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to following your journey at Stickwood and seeing where your comedy journey takes you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you asked me to do this. I'm excited to see the podcast grow. I think you have tons of different creative people coming on. And I think that's awesome. I think having different perspectives and creativity is so important creative processes are different um yeah i'm stoked thank you so much this was so much fun thank you guys so much for listening to your creative roadmap podcast if you want to follow me or anything that i'm doing with my fine art my clothing brand that i'm working on or do business with my social media agency you can find all of those things at artbyost.com And if you want to follow my current art project that I'm working on, Characters of Horror, you can follow me on Instagram at artbyost.com. And my social media agency is 529detroit.com. Thank you so much, and we will see you guys next week. Peace.